Hey everybody, George Donnelly here. I want to talk to you about how to increase Bitcoin Cash adoption by a factor of 100. So, first of all, why? What's the big deal? Who cares? Bitcoin Cash works. It's got lots of options already, right? Why do we, what's, why? So, first of all, to serve the world in a historic manner. We can help bring uh, prosperity, financial inclusion, liberty, uh, because ultimately Bitcoin Cash strikes at the heart of the nation state uh, in the corporate uh, cartelized world. Uh, you know, in a, we can do great things here. Uh, we can help a lot of people. We can bring uh, on board to the, on, uh, to the global economy hundreds of millions of productive people who today are limited in how they can add value uh, to, to the world. You know, think about all of the, 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 the valuable individuals, the human talent that is uh, lost today due to malnutrition, uh, lack of education, um, you know, you name it. More, uh, uh, you know, close to home reason uh, that people, uh, you know, on our BTC uh, might be happy about. Uh, let's flip in BTC. There's no reason why we can't do it. Um, let's make some money, you know, to have a lot of fun on a shared mission. You know, at the end of the day, you know, tribes and cliques and, and teams exist uh, because, you know, maybe the whole reason that we developed language is so that we could collaborate effectively, so we could uh, form groups that have a shared narrative, a shared story, a shared why, and feel good, feel realized as human beings uh, working towards those goals. Uh, to end global poverty, uh, you know, uh, essentially the nation state has given up on this. They, they did what they could. They did a little bit. Um, uh, they did quite a bit, you know, but, uh, I don't think they're going to get us the rest of the way. And there still is a very, very large number of people, uh, in poverty, maybe hundreds of millions, uh, if not more, depending on what your definition of poverty is and to unleash all of the benefits of prosperity to the billions of people in the developing world. You know, it's like network effect. You know, I have a telephone. I can't really, it's, it's just a paperweight. You have a telephone too? Hey, we can talk. Cool. Um, but when you bring on hundreds of millions of people, billions of people onto the telephone network, you get the modern world. Talk. We can talk. We can communicate. We can have commerce. Uh, we can have, you know, the internet. Um, all of this. So imagine right now, you know, in we may only have a billion, uh, maybe two billion uh, people who are uh, plugged in, connected to the global economy, adding value. You know, and, and as we all know, the more, just like with, with telephones, the more people that have them, the more valuable each telephone is. Uh, it's the same way with the global economy. The more productive people that are plugged into it, the more valuable each of us is, the more we can earn, the more cool stuff we can have, the more cool experiences we can have. Everything gets better. So that's why. That's why we should onboard. We, we should increase adoption efforts by a factor of hundreds of 100. So what's the vision? Onboarding billions of people. There are probably about 5 billion adults, you know, say between 15 and 64 that we could target to materially impact global poverty in a way that no nation state uh, program can because at the end of the day all the nation state understands is um is you know how to protect their in group their group of insiders which you know their elite which in a country like the united states is is a fairly large group of people but you come to a country like colombia or nigeria or zimbabwe that's a lot smaller number of people um 99 of the world has yet to hear about bitcoin I mean, just imagine the opportunities, you know. Some people say, no, the number is it's, it's smaller than that. Like, some people have heard the word Bitcoin, but they don't really know anything about it. Uh, some people have Bitcoin, and they still don't know very much about it. Uh, there's so much opportunity out there. And to facilitate economic miracles across the developing world. You know, after World War II, 
you know, we saw, uh, um, let's see, Singapore, Korea, Japan, um, uh, China, uh, did I mention Taiwan? Um, <clears throat> You know, when you liberalize, when you include people, when you give people options for international trade, the the impact of that can be huge, huge. And today, you know, some of the largest trading partners for developed world countries are those new East Asian uh, economies. So there's no reason why we can't take Brazil, for example, to... Um, on a you know accelerate brazil on a path that really it's already on you know but i have to say that government regulation and limits in brazil are pretty oppressive or nigeria or kenya or indonesia you know these are all very large countries lots of population lots of human capital but uh they're lacking uh quite a lot uh in order to realize it all um and Bitcoin Cash can 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 play a very large role in making all of that happen. So when I talk about increasing adoption, I'm not talking about corporate adoption, not institutional adoption, not government adoption. Definitely not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about regular people, just regular people. Um, why focus on the developing world? Well, financial exclusion is is a big deal there. Um, You know, they're they're in the in the developed world. We take it for granted, really, that anybody can have banking. Now, I was once turned down for a bank account in the in the in, in the United States. I was quite shocked. Some I wasn't high class enough for them. I guess I worked like two doors down from them uh, in an investment bank, uh, just a block or so from the Board of Trade in Chicago. But you know, no. <laughs> um. And that was a, quite a shock to me that, you know, uh, some banks didn't want me as their, their customer. But in the United States, you know, if you want a bank account, you can basically uh, you can basically get it. But in the developing world, that's far from true. For example, the top uh, consumer bank here in Colombia, you have to have a job and a letter from your employer in order to get a bank account or you're, you're SOL, man. You're not getting one. Um, and that feeds into the whole informality thing, the whole informal economy. Now, Colombia, which is in the top 50 uh, countries in the world in economic freedom, still 65%, give or take, of jobs are in the informal economy. So that means you can't, like, you can't really get a letter that says you have a job. Because also, when people have jobs here in Colombia, uh, they start developing like seniority. I forget the precise word for it that's used in Spanish. And that, that d develops them certain benefits and rights under the law that can be quite oppressive for small businesses to pay. And so even when it is a semi-formal uh, employment, very few businesses really want to start issuing letters uh, that could later be used as evidence in a court case in order to demand some kind of compensation for some whatever. Uh, because frankly, uh, the law here is tilted against employers and for employees. Um, so really, people in the developing world are, are locked out of, um, of, of, of banking. Um, and so, you know, and some people take this in crypto as like, oh, you be your own bank. Yeah, no, it's not not really. That's It's not just a matter of giving people. That's a surface level analysis. It's not just a matter of having a bank account. Yeah, that is an obstacle, you know. Um, and but that's not the whole. That's, that's just like the tip of the iceberg. Right. So it's not just. So be, I've always thought be your own bank is kind of a foolish thing to say, frankly. Um, so another way that financial exclusion happens in the developing world is in the obstacles that are, that are there to forming, legally forming 
uh, a business. You know, Hernando de Soto, the Peruvian economist, author of Mis- The Mystery of Capital, he did a, um, a, an experiment um, in uh, Peru to f- where he wanted to form, legally form a business. And it literally took his people months um, working full time to get all the permissions and all the sign-offs and all the forms signed out in triplicate and whatever. Uh, Property ledgers. So, you know, in the United States, uh, I think, you know, it's taken for granted, you know, you own a house, then, uh, you know, your name is on the property ledger and that's public information. It's not terribly difficult to, to take title of your house. You wouldn't think of not taking title of your house. We have title... Title search services as well, right? So you can verify that the person selling you a piece of real estate, you know, has title and there are not any significant claims against it. Uh, But that's a little more challenging in the developing world. For example, Hernando de Soto went to Cairo and did some some research there and discovered that... um, discovered that people who are living in homes frequently did not have title to those homes. You know, you they their neighbors knew that that was their house, but you went to the city registry and you couldn't verify that. Uh, here in Colombia, there's an uh, NGO called Sujo, S-U-Y-O, that actually on a one-by-one basis helps people to gain title to their property, which is nice. It's very nice. Um, But the problem with that is that it's not really scalable. Um, And it's, it's all about fitting into uh, the, the government system. You know, I think they do great work, Uh, but it's not, it's not really a solution. Uh, long-term solution. It helps some people. And why Why is it such a big deal? Well, it can be expensive to register your property. Uh, it can also generate uh, large tax bills to you. Um, yeah. So that, you know, that's another obstacle to economic growth in the developing world that's part of financial exclusion. You know, there's also obstructive regulation. Uh, there's uh, beyond what I've already mentioned. Lack of capital formation uh, is happening due to all of these thi- these obstacles, which also means there's a lot of opportunity for capital to be formed. That's that's quite that's that could that's quite an oppor- you know, as as an investor as a capitalist like you want to have, you know, your fingers in the pie, <laughs> so to speak. Like you want to have, you want to be in control of capital because capital is what permits the creation of new value. Uh, of new capital, Um, and there's a huge opportunity here. Another thing that happens in the developing world is corruption, hyperinflation. Look at Venezuela, look at Zimbabwe. Uh, Turkey has had some. uh, Colombia, even before the coronavirus situation in 2019, devalued uh, the currency about 30% relative to the dollar. So there are billions of people in the developing world, and they have essentially been excluded uh, from the globalizing uh, world economy. That's an opportunity. So let's take a look at the the inflows challenge. So, um, you know, to get adoption right now, the standard method is merchants and meetups, right? But um, you onboard a merchant, maybe you onboard 10, you have a couple events, they get a little bit of business, you know, and you, you only onboarded them because you promised them new customers. That's the only way uh, to, to sustainably onboard new merchants. That's all re- merchants really care about. That's why they are merchants. That's why they're in business. New customers. But after a couple months, like, you know, maybe you're only doing one event a month and you're, you're circulating it around uh, your 10 or maybe now you have 20 merchants. And some of the merchants are like, hey, uh, man, I haven't had a customer pay with Bitcoin Cash in like three weeks. Uh, what's going on here? You promised me new customers. And so then maybe you go out of your way 
uh, to, to go and patronize these different merchants. Maybe you're spending your money on things you don't actually want. You're just kind of trying to keep the merchants happy. It is, this is not really sustainable. Uh, this is not scalable. Uh, this is the inflows challenge. So, you know, people like us who have, you know, years of experience here or, you know, are in this for, for passion or whatever, you know, we think Bitcoin Cash is the bee's knees. But you take a p regular person who earns uh, in local fiat and is used to spending in local fiat and um, they're not going to go and take their salary to a local exchange or, uh, or an ATM or something, pay a few percentage points to get a BCH. And, you know, maybe they get it at 340 and then the price drops to 260 and their, their purchasing power is eviscerated. All of that just so they can spend it at local merchants who already accept local fiat. Uh, so that the whole uh, intra, intranational, you know, inside a nation uh, commerce thing is probably not going to be the first uh, niche that we capture. It's things that happen cross-border, really, because that, that's where the real strength is. So... Given this dynamic, um, unless we have money, new BCH coming in, people getting paid directly in BCH, um, then there's really not BCH fl you know, floating around in people's wallets to go and spend at the merchants. And so we lose. We start losing merchants. And in fact, they start becoming a little cynical and a little frustrated. And... So then you look at the whole merchant and meetups thing and you're kind of like, is this a good use of anybody's time? Is this really paying off? Or is this just a treadmill that's not really going anywhere? You know, take a look at, uh, you know, Rappi, which I believe is a double unicorn, had investment from SoftBank, for example. It's a big deal here in Latin America. It's, it's a food, food you know, a generic food ordering, food delivery service. They uh, have had wonderful and sustainable merchant adoption, uh, at least here in Colombia. Uh, you know, you can go on, you can order groceries, specialty items, you know, cold cuts, um, meat from butchers, you know, all, all a large number of restaurants are on there, if not all. Rappi takes 30% of every transaction, you know. Um but it's still quite popular. And that's because it brings a primary value. It does it very well, which is new customers. You know, I can patronize all these different uh, restaurants without ever having to visit the restaurant. Um, you know, so that, yeah. So we have to deal with the inflows challenge. Right? Any, 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 pro, any, any work, any merchant adoption, any, any adoption work, that really is not a, that is not addressing the inflows challenge, um, you know, and that that expects you know. So some adoption could be you know virtual, or you know derivatives or or other kinds of stuff, but anything that that involves merchants and that doesn't address an inflows challenge, you know, like let's say so let's an an, ex, an exception to this might be you know like a, a merchant who does mobile top ups across the globe. All right, this guy's got a chance because, you know, you can spend to and from anywhere and there are people in the developed world who have Bitcoin Cash. This is this has a chance. But you take uh, merchants that aren't, you know, that don't have that benefit, local merchants, supermarkets, restaurants, uh, even a lot of even e-commerce, uh, you know, because shipping of packages across borders is not always uh, feasible. If you're not, if it's if the plan is not taking into account the inflows challenge, it's 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 uh, that's a problem. That that's a blind spot. So enter remittances, seven hundred billion dollar a year uh, industry. Uh, the great majority of it, maybe five sevenths, going to lower and middle income countries, the developing world. Fees are at, uh, six to eight percent on average. Uh, you know, if you want to send small amounts, it can be prohibitively expensive. 
uh, because usually a lot of these places charge a fixed fee plus a percentage, right? So if the fixed fee is like five bucks and you're sending 15 bucks, suddenly that's just that is 33%. And if uh, there are a lot of cases around uh, migration uh, in the developing world, be it migration, be it for, you know, like people crossing uh, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Mexico, uh, Costa Rica, you know, migrant laborers, uh, people uh, migrating from Haiti to Chile due to instability. Um, the millions of people who have left Venezuela, most of them going to Colombia. They are um, they are migrating uh, in order to to earn some money. And send it home because maybe they left their children and their parents at home, right? So they have the able, you know, if you look at Venezuela, in many cases, it's the able bodied people who left. In some cases, whole families left. But in many cases that I've seen, just the able bodied people left. Uh, and they left their children at home with the grandparents of the children. And the expectation is, well, they got to work to send money home. But a lot of these people don't have a a huge uh, earning capacity. I mean, especially even if they had they were had skilled professions back home, they're in a new place. You know, they're selling ice cream uh, on the street. They are uh, doing deliveries. They are uh, you know doing janitorial work. They're driving cabs or Ubers or whatnot. So you know, maybe they only have in a day or a week or a month you know, maybe a hundred dollars to send home. And, you know, if they lose 10 or 15% of that to fees that over time, that that's a lot that adds up a lot. That's, that's, that's kind of parasitic, um, of these remittance companies. Um, and this is where, you know, Bitcoin cash really shines because, you know, if you can enter relatively cheaply, then, you know, there's all, practically no fee at all to send. Um, and then if there's merchant adoption on the other side, then they, they never have to cash out, right? Like if you have to ca cash in, then you have to cash out like you're paying fees twice. You're paying liquidity fees twice. But if you, if you can cash, if, you, if on the other side, you can spend it at merchants, then you don't have to cash out, right? That reduces costs. Or, you know, maybe it just puts them on the merchant, but then we, we work on the merchant to continue circulating that, that those Bitcoin cash. There are also hassles, delays, hidden fees. I tried to send money via Western Union about 12 years ago. I was banned. <laughs> I had I had proper ID and everything. Um, and this happens to people all the time. Uh, the industry as a whole uh, is just starting to enter the digital realm. In the developing world, it's fragmented. Uh, you know, cross-border fiat flows are always going to be highly regulated uh, by nation states. There's always going to be red tape around that. Uh, and that's Bitcoin Cash's strong point. Just crosses borders as if they didn't exist. Um, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa are special opportunities. In Venezuela, for example, I've seen people uh, say that they pay up to 40% on their remittances. Um, Cuba is a special case with, uh, U S sanctions, etc. So this is a real op. This is, I, this is really the best opportunity, uh, for inflows. There's also outsourcing, you know, like freelancers and things like that, but that's not as, as diverse. That's not as regular. Uh, you know, like this month, a freelancer might get paid in Bitcoin cash from a customer and then maybe they don't do work for that person again for a while. But remittances are things people send home month after month after month. Uh, and they sustain, they sustain not just families uh, in the developing world, they sustain whole countries. There are countries where, for example, like Haiti or Guatemala uh, and some African countries where uh, remittances are a, a notable portion of GDP, anyway, anywhere from maybe seven to sixty uh, percent of GDP. Haven't looked at those numbers in a while, but it's significant. So uh, right now, uh, adoption efforts, um, you know, the, for regular people, um, are 
you know, I'm not necessarily talking about adoption of like margin trading or derivatives or, uh, you know, people buying grayscale Bitcoin cash or whatever. Uh, but, you know, real adoption, of regular people, everyday life are ad hoc and hobbyist. Um, it's not really scalable, you know, and it, there's a treadmill aspect to it uh, because in because the inflows problem has not been solved. Um, but really, adoption has to be systematic in order to get beyond, you know, like if you say, hey, let's 1, 1. 1.1x uh, Bitcoin Cash adoption. It's not just, it's just not exciting. It's, it, it doesn't get anybody excited to just increase it 10% year over year. That's not fast enough. You know, this is still a new technology. We should be growing by several hundred percent uh, per year. Um, and to do that, we have to be systematic. There literally is no alternative. We must be systematic. Ad hoc and hobbyist efforts are not enough. Never will be. Must be systematic. So take a look at, you know, a couple examples. Ponzi schemes. <laughs> not that I'm proposing doing a Ponzi scheme uh, in the developing world are very popular. The Ponzi schemes in the developing world are quite popular. People contact me all the time uh, via uh, BCH Latam saying, hey, what's your system? Uh, what's the initial investment? Hey, what are the details? How do I make money here? And because they're so used to being pitched Ponzi schemes who say, yeah, initial investment, $10,000, you get 1% every day. If you don't, uh, if you don't withdraw it, you can stake it in this thing. And you know, our fake token <laughs> and, uh, you know, you'll get 1.5% a day, but you got to wait like three years to cash out, you know, whatever, or hex, you know, the whole hex thing that has been, I think, very clever in all of the, uh, the tactics, all the little tricks, uh, for, um, you know, for getting people to uh, lock funds here or move funds on this date or whatever. All that craziness. Those are systems, uh, and even though they're not, you know, they're not, they're even though they're distasteful examples, we can learn from them. We need to learn from them. Um, and we need to build an adoption system, maybe more than one. Um, it needs to harness uh, the labor of the people that we hoped will that we hope will adopt it. You know, it needs to be like an Uberish crowdsourcing kind of thing. Um, people who add value to the system, who get educated, you know, who watch an educational video, who educate others, who onboard merchants, who onboard users, who who just transact. We pay them. We pay them for every little bit of value they add. We pay them in, a, in an SLP token that we bootstrap. We build a new market for it. We get it listed. We get people using it. They can spend it at the merchants. It's a rewards token. You onboard a merchant, you get 10 tokens. You hold a meetup, you know, verifiable, produce a video and photo, you get 20 tokens. You send the tra transaction, you get 0 0.1, whatever, right? It has to be like this. And then we have a system that anyone can join because obviously there's no initial investment. This is not some Ponzi scheme. And you get paid constantly, you know, as long as you, you're doing work, you know. You know, so level 1.0, HODL. Level 2.0, stake. Level 3.0, people get paid just to use the system. They get paid. They get paid to add value. This could become a job for people. Just the same way that Uber has become a job for people. There are people whose job is Uber. There are people whose job can be Bitcoin Cash. So, uh, you know, next steps. How do we make this happen? Uh, is to build a uh, progressive web app, MVP. Just bypass the app stores right away. Screw it. Why are we going to waste time on, on letting Google or Apple shut down the app at a critical moment? You know, especially because th there's no way this app is paying them their 30%. They can forget about it, right? So we just bypass the app stores. I'm looking for a lead developer to take the reins and to show some passion.
for this vision, you know, some excitement, some commitment. Um, you know, I could, I, I've been a developer for 20 years. I could get up to speed. I could hire, you know, just, uh, just some guys who know how to code. Right. But I, I would like to have a technical person who actually cares about this, uh, on board, you know, uh, start, then we build it. We start onboarding people. I think probably funding of a half to $1 million, uh, gets us to a place where we can start generating income. Uh, within the app, there are so many different uh, monetization uh, methods. Currently, I'm working on a new biz plan version, uh, version 0 0.7. I finished um, almost 11 months ago, distributed the BCH ecosystem fund. Uh, you know, the, you know, Roger's great, but I have no response on that uh, from uh, him. Um, so, you know, if you want to, if you want to contribute, you know, um, you know, I, I don't really want to, I, I, sometimes people say things to me like, oh, that's impossible. That was already tried, blah, 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 blah. You know, like that's not really helpful, you know? So if you want to help, help me make the parts that you'd like happen. Um, you know, that's really the way to give, uh, to help. It's not to tell people that something's impossible. Nothing about this is impossible. People drop millions of dollars into apps and ICOs and things that never go anywhere. This is cheap. This is really cheap. Uh, and I've been working on this for three years. I've been researching this for three years. I've been onboarding thousands of people across uh, eight nations, 20 cities, three, uh, three continents. Um, so, yeah, basically this app... Uh, this app has to happen. You know, if, if I have to code it myself, I will, if you know, and you know, and I think another thing you can do is build your own adoption system. You know, maybe this is not exactly, you know, up your alley, but think about adoption in terms of a system. It's a system. It's a loop. It's a circle. It keeps going. Anything less than that is not going to get us where we need to go. It's just, it's, you know, the whole ad hoc and hobbyist thing. That, that can be how we bootstrap, right? Like Airbnb, uh, to bootstrap, they went and, you know, manually added listings from Craigslist, right? That's manual bootstrapping. There's nothing wrong with uh, that, that kind of elbow grease, um, that, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, hard work, manual work. But that's 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 the that's priming the pump. That's kickstarting the system. If we don't have a system for uh, getting adoption, for onboarding people, for for creating incentives, for creating rewards, for making it a self-sustaining system, then you know we're just we're just dumping gasoline instead of pouring gasoline into an engine. We're just dumping gasoline on the ground. You know, and hoping that it somehow magically someone else does the work for us. That we, we, only us, only we who really care about these things, only we are going to do it. You know, you, it's not going to be a Coinbase. Uh, it's not going to be uh, a Libra. Uh, you know, all of these uh, other, all of these big crypto companies are deeply ensconced already in the whole corporate nation state system. They're, they're, any proposal launched from them is going to have to, you know, happen within within the the little box, little lines the nation state has made for us. Um, and uh, you know, there's a reason that financial exclusion in the developing world uh, exists, and it's the same thing as in the United States. It's because um, it's it's advantageous for people to go to the government get special privileges that protect them from competition and and that works that that works that's a viable path for for profit it's not an ethical path but it's viable and the same thing is that that's you know the same thing happens in the developing world but even greater you know in a country like uh colombia uh only maybe 20 percent of people are doing okay 80 percent are, are pretty much uh in 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 poverty um, and that's because there's an elite that tilts the playing field in their own favor. So 
tremendous opportunity here. Let's 100x uh, Bitcoin Cash adoption. Um, you know, I'm I'm getting my Bitcoin Cash site uh, stuff uh, on track, training, onboarding people. But once things are on track, I'm gonna put out a new version of this business plan, and I'm I'm gonna put up a flip starter and market the heck out of it, uh, and see if we can uh, get this thing going. If you're interested in in getting this going, share this video, share your thoughts, um, make people aware of this. So thank you very much.